Welcome to Vantage Point. On this episode, we will be discussing on the topic of youth and their participation in nation building. And I have huge respect for my two speakers here today. Firstly, they are about my age, but they are doing great things uh, for the country and inspiring many Malaysians, myself included. These guys come from very different background, doing different things, but their objectives are not too far apart. That is, both are driven to make Malaysia better through the respective work that they are doing. So for that, I'd like to welcome and thank on my far left here is Johnson Oi. He's the founder of Epic Collaborative. Thanks for that having runs me. a platform to get people to come together to build homes for the Orang Asli. Am I right? Okay, and you have recently completed your eighth project. Correct. Congratulations to you. Thank you. And next to him, we have someone, no stranger to many of us, Tunku yeah. Abidin Muhris, founding president of Ideas, Institute of Democracy and Economic Affairs. He also writes in the Star newspaper in his column called Abiding Times. Now, his articles offer pertinent observations into the social and political affairs in the country and often a very refreshing and I might add witty too. And Fred, not if you have missed his articles because it's all compiled in these two books here, which I've been reading for the past couple of nights. So I would like to go to Abidin first. Thank you. You have been very consistent in the message that you are trying to send across, that is um, the ideas espoused by your think tank ideas, that is uh, freedom, liberty, and limited government control in the economy. Okay. I think this resonates with what a lot of young people want as well. But we can't help to feel that there are so many interference uh, to what we are deemed, what we're supposed and not supposed to do. For example, the music that we should be listening to, or the books that should be banned, or what kind of movies should we be watching or should not be watching. And we would think that with increasing access to information and internet, we would have more options and choices. But that's, this doesn't seem to be the case in Malaysia. Yeah, I mean, this is. It's self-defeating. Every time I see, uh, you know, a book being banned or a movie being banned, I mean, who, who, are, who are people that, you know, who are they kidding, right? People are going to uh, be able to access these books or these uh, movies anyway if they really wanted to uh, to do so. I mean, we're living in, in an age of, uh, you know, increased connectivity. Yes. Uh, and I think anyone who is determined to watch something that the government uh, censors or is deemed illegal uh, will be able to do so. Um, I think what should be done instead is to inculcate um, values uh, through family, through the, through the education system, so that people can determine for themselves uh, what is good, what is, uh, you know, what is good principles and good values, uh, and what are bad values and what are bad um, ideas, and let um, the rakyat. Uh, as individuals, for themselves. trust for themselves. Yeah. Was it the reason why you formed ideas in the first place? Because you feel there are present yeah. values and mechanisms that is lacking? That's one of the reasons. Um, I think, you know, it started in London uh, when me and Fred Aus and uh, Juan Seifel, who I, I believe both are on Astro quite often, yes. um, and uh, we, we founded something uh, for Malaysia, mm -hmm. and then we came, all of us came back a few years later, so we uh, relaunched ourselves as ideas. And one of the motivations was exactly this, this idea that uh, government is too big, it's intervening too much in our lives. I mean, uh, yes, the social stuff that you mentioned, but also on the, in the economic sphere. Uh, so that's something that we're, um, you know, we like to uh, comment on and give policy proposals about, especially in the context of the recent budget. Um, and then um, also other ideas that we think the Merdeka generation, uh, people like Tinku Abdul Rahman, uh, and Tun Dr. Ismail, uh, Tun Tang Cheng Lok. I mean, the values that they espoused, which is quite different from what the present generation of And what, that, what are the other values that you're talking about? Well, um, togetherness, mm -hmm. uh, tolerance, um, trusting people, trusting Malaysians to come together on their own without mm -hmm. having government force things down people's necks. What was the reason behind the founding of Epic Collaborative? I think it's just that people this day and age, they don't, they don't know where to go to if they want to find out about projects like this. Or, or how, how, do I, how do I contribute best uh, to communities? Because I want to make sure that my efforts are significant. There are avenues uh, to make this happen. It, it's just that we realized that there, were a lacking, uh, there was a lack of avenues. So we realized we needed to start something. And, and that's why we decided to start Epic Collaborative, where we design and we create platforms to increase collaboration between um, the rakyat. Um, to, to be able to impact community in a significant way. So the difference that we, we're trying to bring about is 
that you don't have to sacrifice your entire life. You know, of course, their their history is great. It's like Gandhi, as Mother Teresa, they're awesome. You know, they sacrificed their life. But most of us don't aspire or, or don't have that convenience or, or or actually want to live that sort of life. But what we believe in is that if everybody just gives a little bit of themselves, then we can make a big difference. You know, you, you, all you have to do is just give up a few minutes in a day and do it consistently and we'll be able to see significant difference. You know, it, it's, it's about getting 100% of the world's population or, the, or Malaysians mm. to be involved in 100%, involved in solving 100% of, of Malaysian problems rather than just depending on 5% of that population that's doing it for a full-time full -time job. I like to go back to uh, Abidin because you, we see that we have a lot of uh, youth social civil initiatives coming up yeah, post um, the post the general elections in March 2008, and you started writing during that period, yeah. that time, that critical moment. How things have how has things changed so far? Yeah, well, I think Johnson just picked up on that very important point. Civil society uh, has grown so much over the past few years to an extent that you know if you asked. Uh, an observer of Malaysian politics, maybe you know, even seven, eight years ago, uh, if they could ever see a time when civil society could be like this now, uh, I think it's, it's very unlikely that they would have foreseen this. Um, it's not just uh, research institutes and NGOs like Ideas, but also initiatives like what Johnson mm -hmm. is doing. Um, and I go to schools up and down the country. Um, you know, every every week I'm in a different college or different school, uh, rural areas, urban areas. Um, you know, the elite colleges and also the less well-known ones and everywhere I see young Malaysians wanting to get involved either in either the environment, in, in, in voter registration drives or in, uh, uh, you know, cancer awareness, AIDS awareness. Uh, so I think this is a very exciting time for Malaysian civil society. It's not just, and in it, I think I just want to stress again, it's not just explicitly political things, mm -hmm. but um, other aspects of, of helping the community as well. Let's talk about how youth can participate more actively in a democratic process because at the end of the day, policies, this, this has to be formulated at the political side, political side, political level, but we are looking at the youth nowadays, they are shying away from politics. We'll get to that after our first commercial break. We'll see you after this, so stay with us. Are you still watching Vantage Point and we are on the topic of youth and their participation in nation building. I'd like to go to Johnson because apart from EPIC, which you help build homes for the Orang Asli, yeah. you also advocate young people to register as voters previously. What are your thoughts about the assumption that youth are shying away from politics and they generally have that tidak apa attitude towards politics? Well, I, I think it is true that that assumption is um, you, if you go anywhere, especially if you if you speak to all, all the um, all the people, they would say, yeah, you know, the, the youth they're not interested at all. They're only really interested in the things that they care about, especially the issues of politics. Mm -hmm. um, and and I guess that's that's true to a certain extent, where um, you know I think youth in general they feel like politics it's a bit too far from what they can actually impact. You know, they feel like if what, what does my one vote actually mean? Mm -hmm. You know, if I were to register as a voter, if I were to vote, will that actually make a difference? Right. So I believe that people these days really just need to. We need to rekindle that that belief that indeed, I think people want difference. Want to, want well, generally, to the youth have negative perception on politics, and sometimes they think. It's boring, it's complicated, and it's a good job to some of them. But we see that a lot of young people are taking their arguments, heated arguments online. And it, whether it is a constructive or hollow arguments, that's debatable. But it means that the young people, they know issues, they want to care about certain issues, but perhaps is there a lack of proper medium or channel? Or what do you think I, it's I the think gap? I think a couple of things I'd like to add to what Johnson said. I think, first of all, uh, democracy isn't just about voting, right? Yeah. So I think what you, what you mentioned about the fact that debates are uh, taking place. I think it's very important. What we mentioned earlier about the growth of civil society it's, it, itself is also a very uh, important development because a healthy democracy has a healthy civil society and these are platforms where people can uh, debate and, 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 and propose uh, policies and you can do a lot, you can contribute a lot 
uh, to democracy uh, without having to vote, right? Uh, you can write, you can debate, you can push your uh, policies forward, you can build houses. Um, and, uh, uh, but when it comes to voting, I think you know, what we and ideas have been advocating uh, for a while is uh, voter registration um, is, is, you know, is a bit unnecessary. And, and, I mean, I, I, was in, I was in the UK. It's an automatic process mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in, in many other advanced democracies. Yeah. Once you um, attain the uh, age of suffrage, uh, you automatically uh, are registered by the appropriate authority. The, uh, the, the idea here that you have to go to the EC or post office or whatever and then fill in the form uh, is, is, a, is a needless uh, bureaucratic step. Uh, totally so, agree with you. And you were advocating for the voting age to be lowered to 18 years old. What we were doing is we were trying to get people registered in general, the mm -hmm. youth in general. We wanted to get them registered and we were trying to tell them that it's not just about voting for party A or party B, but it's just about showing that you care mm -hmm. uh, for your country. So vote, registering as a voter, I guess it, it is an inconvenience, but it's also an opportunity to show, yeah. um, you know, opportunity to show that they care. Mm -hmm. I think until we have automatic voter registration, what people like Johnson, you know, those drives are very important because uh, I think young people, once they know that they have the power uh, to vote, uh, we may start looking at issues a bit more seriously and more uh, engaging way. Okay, so what do you think, why are we not moving towards automatic voters registration? Mm, I don't know, you have to ask the politicians <laughs> that. And, and, but that's something that we always try and yeah. uh, encourage. And I think ideas, um, we, we do talk to the uh, EC, the, mm. the Elections Commission, and I think we have raised this, this point before. Mm. Uh, I think it just, uh, it's just a matter of uh, some, some time down the line, uh, it, it may happen. Yeah. Democracy, like you said, is just not a about putting your votes at the ballot box. It's also about how you can be involved in the community like what Johnson has yeah. said. But I feel that schools are not doing a very good job in educating their citizens to, to be active in democracy. I remember, I mean, uh, my Sejarah Tingkatan Tiga lessons that taught us about the state and the legislative judiciary, but it's a lot of uh, memorization and not really understanding how these different components, how do, how do they function, maybe there is need to change the education so that we become more active people in democracy? Yeah, I, I guess that's, that can be one thing as well, but let me just speak on behalf of the layman. So a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of memorizing, there's a lot of academics involved. When you put a word like policy out there, even though it's three syllable, it, it seems like a big word to a lot of, um, a lot of lay people out there. H how will my actions today really translate to actions that might that impact tomorrow? You know, that, that's all they want to know is my effort going to be significant or not? And so, like you said, actually, by, by particip participating in activities like Epic, Epic Homes, you know, that itself is also crafting policy. You know, it's not exactly sitting in a room with ca academics, mm -hmm. uh, forming something, brainstorming, but by modeling out how you want uh, society to be, how do you want teamwork to be, how do you want a country to work together, how do you want community relationships to be built, that itself could also affect policy. But nonetheless, I do think the academic route does need to be looked oh, at again. And, 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 and if you if you read my uh, books, um, you will see that I, I, I often make this point about um, how history and citizenship need to be taught properly in schools. I mean, it's much, much more than learning the dates or learning the uh, Rukunagara. It's, it's, it's about understanding why the institution, such as the monarchy, why do we have a monarchy? We have to look at the history uh, and then understand how the institution of monarchy uh, evolved and occupied the current place in, in Malaysian uh, uh, political life today. And all the other institutions as well. I mean, you know, the PDRM, um, the, the, the courts, uh, all of these have a history uh, that Malaysian children uh, should be taught about um, and, and to really see how they developed over time. How, how does it all connect as well? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's so do you feel that is lacking in our education system? From what I've seen, yes, I, I, mm -hmm. there's, okay. there's a lot of room. Okay, I'd like to go to Johnson. We also t see that the government is doing quite a bit to engage the youth, like uh, trying to create this uh, What I Am For You Youth Volunteering Fund of 100 million uh, ringgit. How do you find such initiatives? Will it get you on board? Um, I don't believe so, because it, it will help those that already have a cause, or already have a mission in mind. But to actually get some to put the money on the table 
and to get a youth to look at it and say, okay, now I'm going to look for something that I care about and want to do it because of the money. I, I don't think money has ever really been the issue. It's, not, it's definitely not the first step into motivating a youth to, do, to want to do anything. Okay. Uh, I think if you want to get them involved, you want to get them interested, you got to just bring them down to the ground. Let them see what's happening, um, how, how different cultures are living, how different people groups are living. And if they spot something that they care about, that will be, I guess, the best motivation for them. And then money will be just second or third step. Okay. We are seeing like uh, quite a few politicians are trying to engage with the youth, organizing tweet-ups and meet-ups, Yamcha sessions and stuff. But is this, in your opinion, working? Uh, to get to the youth? Uh, yes and no. I think, I think you know, sometimes you have these tweet-ups. And what it is, it's, it's these people who already are supporting the politician anyway, and then they yeah. just go out there and sort of extol the virtues of their chosen uh, politician. And, and then sometimes, they, you know, there'll be the slanging match between them and the other side. I think, you know, I, I think Johnson's right. Look, young people are the best people to connect and encourage other young people to be involved in volunteerism, uh, be involved in building houses in different communities. And, and I think the, the, mon the money is an issue, but I think there's so many groups of young Malaysians already there who want to do something but don't have the funds to do it. I think that's where, uh, you know, this, the, the, the Dana Belia One Malaysia, that's where the things come in. I mean, so it provides uh, a, 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 a treasure chest for those who already want to do something. The, the good initiatives will, will come organically uh, and then we have to make sure that the money is diverted. To those I'll need to take this discussion to the last commercial break, but when we come back, maybe we can speak to these three young guys here about what are their aspirations for the country. We'll go for the last commercial break. Stay with us.